Our goal is to empower the viewer in terms of improving their understanding of how alcohol and drugs interact with the brain and how alcoholism and drug abuse are, in a very real sense, brain-based disorders. For example, we answer questions about genetics. We talk about different brain areas involved in different drug effects. What happens when we take alcohol and drugs for longer and longer periods of time? And how does the brain recover when we stop taking alcohol and drugs? We really wanted to bring neuroscience and graduate level research and just make it a lot of fun, make it interesting, and, and make it enjoyable for people to watch and learn. What we did was to bring together uh, very talented individuals, um, ranging from some of the top experts in alcohol and drug abuse research, some of the best known clinicians doing substance abuse treatment from around the country, as well as a very, very talented and award-winning production team, both in terms of video production, computer animation, and music composition and recording. We brought all these diverse people together to produce shows which are state-of-the-art, both in terms of the science they're providing and in terms of the quality and level of production. Since the beginning of time, humans have used many different substances to change their mood and state of consciousness. But as we all know, the negative effects of continued drug use, or sometimes even a single episode of drug use, can far outweigh any short-term good feelings that these drugs may create. Indeed, the consequences of drug use make up a large list of negative effects, ranging from nausea and disorientation to serious long-term illnesses and, more often than we care to admit, even death. So with all of these negative consequences, how does someone become a drug abuser, and why do they continue to take drugs? Is it because of a flaw in character, a miserable childhood, or does it simply start as a bad day at work or in school? As we're about to see, for many, the answers to some of these questions can have less to do with the explanations they give and more to do with what's going on, not just inside their head, but specifically inside their brain. Through work in many laboratories, we've learned over the last 30 years that animals and humans will often work hard to receive drugs. And we know they do this because it makes them feel good. That is, they find the experience reinforcing. Depending on how much better they make us feel, there's a possibility that we could become drug dependent. But what leads some of us to use drugs in the first place? What motivates someone to keep taking drugs? And how does a person become drug dependent? Well, as we're about to find out, it's a combination of genetics, brain chemistry, and environment. Whether it's a mouse, monkey, or human, all mammals have very important brain structures organized into a system we call the reward pathways. The reward pathways control all of our pleasurable experiences, from eating to sex. This is why the reward pathways are referred to as the brain's pleasure center. One of the most important parts of the reward pathways is the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is a very small part of the brain. Although it is only about the size of an apple seed, its impact is enormous. The nerve cells in the nucleus accumbens are ultimately responsible for all of our feelings of pleasure. The normal communication processes in the brain use small electrical currents to carry messages. Scientists have found that they can artificially stimulate the nucleus accumbens by using a tiny electrode carrying a small electrical current. Stimulating this area of the brain feels so good to an animal that it will work to the point of exhaustion and sometimes even death to get the stimulation. By proving that we will repeat behaviors regardless of their consequences because they make us feel good, 
Studies like these provide dramatic evidence for a drug abuse theory called the reward or reinforcement model of addiction. This understanding of the reward pathways and the development of the reward model of addiction have in turn led us to a better understanding of substance abusers and their motivations to take drugs. In the past, doctors thought that only individuals who were physically dependent upon a drug were addicted. In other words, drug addicts were only those people who could not function without the drug in their bodies. It was thought that drug addicts needed their drug to avoid uncomfortable and frightening withdrawal symptoms such as tremors, seizures, and hallucinations. This was the thinking behind what was called the dependence theory of addiction. However, the dependence theory was unable to explain why anyone would use drugs enough in the first place to become physically dependent. We need to look at both the positive and negative reinforcing properties of drugs to explain why people would both start using drugs and then continue. By tying the development of substance abuse to drugs' ability to make us feel better, the reinforcement model is able to provide a fuller explanation for our drug-taking behavior than the dependence model. It also provides an explanation that matches what we know about how brain areas such as the reward pathways work. Today we understand that physical dependence is only one of the symptoms of drug abuse. Many addiction specialists now accept that a pattern of continued drug use in spite of repeated harmful consequences is the clearest indicator that a person has a substance abuse problem. But what causes this pattern of drug use to begin? Is it our genetic makeup or is it the stress of the world around us that leads us down the slippery slope to drug abuse? Although having a genetic predisposition is a very important factor, developing a substance abuse problem is influenced not only by our genes, but also by many environmental factors such as our habits, where we live, and what we do for a living. This holds true for many medical problems like cancer and heart disease, as well as for substance abuse. But although many diseases arise from interactions between our bodies and the world around us, it doesn't necessarily mean that all people in the same situation will develop the same disease. So if the circumstances are indeed the same, why do some people develop a disease while others don't? For many people, much of the answer lies deep within our bodies, submerged at the microscopic depths of our cells with our genes. We know that drug abuse, like alcoholism, runs in families. So that brings us to a very important question. Does drug abuse have a genetic basis like alcoholism? Twin studies have shown that, like alcoholism, there is clearly a genetic common denominator for drug abuse that runs in families. Researchers have found that if one of a pair of identical twins abuses drugs, the odds rise greatly that the other twin will also abuse drugs. Even if the twins were separated at birth and raised by different families in different countries, the results are the same. For those of us who are not identical twins, the likelihood of our developing a drug abuse problem is similarly highly influenced by the people we are most genetically similar to, namely, the members of our immediate family. If one of our close relatives, such as a parent, brother, or sister, has a drug problem, then the odds are significantly increased that we will develop a similar problem. The technical term for families with a history of substance abuse is family history positive. Families without a history of substance abuse are termed family history negative. Given all of the evidence that substance abuse has a genetic basis, Many people ask if there are genes specific to this disorder. Considering that humans have many thousands of genes, it is highly unlikely that there is one specific gene whose only job is to determine whether someone will become a drug abuser. Most researchers agree that there are probably a couple of dozen genes that, in different ways, influence the addiction process. Although genes provide a strong biological basis for the development of substance abuse, Genes alone are not always enough. We also know that some people who have no clear genetic predisposition also abuse drugs. Other factors, such as personal history and stress factors, also play an important role. However, unlike genetic predisposition, these other factors have been well recognized for years and have been thoroughly discussed elsewhere. 
In this video series, we will keep most of our focus on the biological factors that contribute to the development of substance abuse. Scientists have been investigating the biological causes of addiction in many ways for many years. Hundreds of studies have clearly shown that voluntarily taking drugs is not a uniquely human behavior. Animals like monkeys, rats, and mice will voluntarily take alcohol and drugs just like people do. Many animals will easily learn to perform a task, such as pressing a lever, in order to receive the very same drugs that people abuse. But why would animals want to work to get drugs? Although we can't look inside an animal's head to see why it will work to get drugs, in many ways its behavior seems to speak for itself. It appears that other animals, just like humans, won't keep doing something that they don't, shall we say, enjoy. But once an animal has learned that behaving in a certain way, such as pressing a lever, will get them an injection of cocaine, many of them will not only repeat that behavior, they will do it as often as possible. When something makes a behavior more likely to be repeated, that something, in this case a drug, is called a reinforcer. So, positive reinforcer is the term for things that make people and animals more likely to repeat certain behaviors so they can get what they want over and over again. Smoking is a good example. People who get pleasure from smoking will often light up continuously. Because the nicotine contained in cigarettes is a very strong reinforcer, a person will repeat their smoking behavior regardless of any negative health consequences. We do this because if something is positively reinforcing, it feels like we're being rewarded for our behavior, which means we will most likely do it again. Many scientists now believe that regardless of what other reasons people might have for using drugs, one of the most important reasons is because in some way the drug makes them feel good or is rewarding to them. When people take a drug because it's rewarding, that drug is called a positive reinforcer. Like nicotine and alcohol, all drugs of abuse are also powerful positive reinforcers. Now it is an interesting part of human and animal behavior that in addition to working for pleasurable things, animals like people will also work to avoid unpleasant things. Things that animals and people will work to avoid are called negative reinforcers. For instance, animals will quickly learn to press a lever to avoid getting shot. In this example, the shock is a negative reinforcer. Although people also like to avoid physically painful events like shocks, they more frequently have to work to avoid feeling uncomfortable emotions or re-experiencing unhappy memories. When people take a drug to avoid feeling bad, it's just like pressing a lever to avoid getting shot. Our understanding of drugs as positive reinforcers and their effects on the reward pathways has led to the development of the reward model of addiction. The reward model of addiction is a widely accepted explanation for how and why people become drug abusers and provides a biological basis for substance abuse.